I hated O'Brien. This bastard arrived in 52, at the very end of the Great Famine, and by 63 he had recruited all the Irish bandits in the Five Points area. He was now Boss O'Brien. There wasn't a single case in the 6th District that he didn't get his dirty hands on. I was a 20-year-old police officer then. Molly and I had been married for a year and lived in a 20 by 15 shack in the slums. She was on Mulberry Street, right behind the church. No one in Lower Manhattan needed to ask, which church? For us Irish, it was the Catholic Church of the Transfiguration. Our home was cold in winter and hot in summer, but we loved each other and that was enough for us. Molly was the light of my life, beautiful, sweet, with an oval face, high cheekbones, a long Irish nose, and full lips that you so wanted to kiss. But her real adornment was her thick copper hair and playful, laughing eyes. She was always happy and smiling, and she never met anyone she didn't like. She was the most beautiful girl in all of Five Points, and she was mine. She worked hard doing laundry for Myrtle O'Brien. Myrtle washed bed linen for the rich. Molly didn't make much money from this business, but she wanted to contribute. She was like that, you know, very loving and faithful. We were young then and had more than enough desires. The church told us that what we were doing was sinful. I didn't believe it. Nothing that brought us so much pleasure and brought us together could be evil. Father Flynn said he abstained from sex. So what could he know about this? Molly had a strong peasant body, wide hips, strong legs, and the best breasts in Lower Manhattan. We made love every night. Molly was often the first to start. In the evenings, she had nothing to do. She couldn't read. Sex was a nice way to end the day. Perhaps that's why her friends kept getting pregnant. Molly was never pregnant. There must have been something wrong with one of us. But I, for one, considered it a blessing. I had Molly all to myself. Her family come from the Burren in County Clare, and these girls are still as fierce and unforgiving as the stormy Atlantic Ocean. She was a true daughter of Ireland, a powerful woman created for work and childbearing. We didn't do anything fancy up there. There was no room for complicated matters. I patrolled from the Franklin Street Station, which is near Collection Pond. It was a long worth to Mulberry and back. They paid a little more because Mulberry was the border between dead rabbits and the Bowery Boys. The rabbits were Irish bandits working for Tammany, and the boys were the force for the Know Nothing Party. Tammany recruited all the Irish they could find, while the activists wanted all of us Irish to be sent back to our homeland. So meetings between the rabbits and the guys were frequent, and we, the police, had to be present at each of them. The nativists arrived first and they did not want to share. So the saloons had signs that said, no dogs or Irish allowed, and they meant it. Their excuse was that the Irish couldn't control their drinking and fighting. Maybe they were right, but in my opinion, lumping us all into one category was ignorant. We Irish worked hard, doing jobs that were too tedious or dirty for the aristocrats. Michael O'Dowell shot Bill Poole at one of these meetings, and Chief Schwartzwalder sent seven of us to arrest the criminal. His words, not mine. I wondered why the Germans were in charge of a section full of Irish. Maybe because he spoke better English. When we arrived, O'Brien was standing in the doorway of O'Dowell's shack. It didn't take a genius to figure out that the boss was putting on a show for the rabbits and the rest of the Irish scum hanging around. I was the youngest in the group. So Sergeant O'Toole led all the negotiations. He said, Now we shouldn't cause trouble, Seamus. We have to arrest this guy, and that's it. O'Brien mounted his high horse. He didn't care about Odulla, and everyone knew it. But he was increasing his reputation among the 6th District crowd. So he swelled up like St. Patrick driving out snakes. This played well against the crowd of traveling Irish, and the crowd was large. Everyone was evil back then. It was difficult to find work. And of course we all blamed the newly freed blacks who were marching north into the city. None of us Irish ever thought that drinking might have been a factor. Then someone threw a stone that hit Timothy O'Higgins, and the revival began. I may not be the tallest Irishman, but I'm tough and I love to fight. 
O'Brien stepped off the porch with a brick in his hand, while O'Toole's back was turned to the crowd. It was obvious that O'Brien was going to hit the sergeant, so I stopped him before he could do it. The fight didn't last long as we quickly took control of the situation. We brought out Odulla from his house and added to the others. He wasn't going to do anything anytime soon anyway. Tammany quickly took them both, as expected. O'Brien turned to me as he left and said, It's not over yet, Riley, not for long, Buko. And he was right. I made myself an enemy for the rest of his life. It was a gorgeous spring day on Mulberry. I whistled as I finished my rounds. I entered our small room with a joyful smile. This quickly changed. There, as if in real life, sat Seamus O'Brien. His grin told me everything. He was going to repay Molly. Molly was simple-minded. She just didn't understand that true evil existed. So she was excited. She ran up to me to peck me on the cheek and said, Councilman O'Brien honored us with a visit, dear. He wants me to be made Aaron at the Tammany reception for Councilman Tweed. The choice was clear. Molly truly was a very special woman, and she was the epitome of pure Irish femininity. But it's clear from the sparkle in O'Brien's eyes that he didn't just mean for Molly to hand Boss Tweed a bouquet of clovers and roses. O'Brien extended his big, meaty paw without breaking stride. He said, No offense about that little misunderstanding last fall, Patrick. I thought, I doubt it. He continued, I wanted to smooth out the corners, nominating Molly on Virgo Aaron. She will be the perfect example of Irish womanhood. The sparkle in his eyes said he wouldn't rest until he slept with my wife. The war had been going on for two years, and she was never far from people's thoughts. This was because the death tolls from places like Antietam and Fredericksburg were a constant reminder. Everyone has lost a brother, son, or nephew. The motto of the Irish Brigade was, Fog and Belatch clear the way. So the 69th New York, known as the Fighting 69th, was on the front lines in terrible places like Bloody Road and Stonewall, and Colonel Meher lost a lot of good Irish boys. Worse, judging by the way things were, it was of no apparent benefit. The Union needed more people for the meat grinder. So the damn Congress passed something called the Draft. The Conscription Act, as they called it, said you could be pulled out of your life and forced to serve in Mr. Lincoln's army. Any capable man between the ages of 20 and 35 was included in this list. Of course, they wrapped it all in an American flag. This could evoke patriotic feelings in every guy, except that the aristocrats immediately ransomed themselves. The price was absurd, $300. This left only the Germans and us Irish in the pool. Monday, the 13th of July, was a hot and clear summer day. We expected trouble. The death toll just came from a place called Gettysburg, and the anti-war newspapers spent the weekend whipping up stories of how we poor whites were paying for the Republican war with our lives. We police officers were assigned to guard the platform in front of the provost marshal's office on 44th Street. There they pulled out names. The first few guys just shrugged their shoulders and went to the provost officers who were there to greet the recruits. These guys probably had no business anyway. The next one had his arm around a beautiful girl who was clearly his wife. He said, but I'm married. I heard a voice from the podium say, whatever, kid, it's your name and you go. Both the man and the woman began to cry. The provost's guards dragged him away, his wife clinging to his arm. It was pathetic. The crowd began to murmur dangerously. Then they pulled out the next name. I heard, Patrick Timothy Riley. There are a lot of Rileys in New York, and most of them were named Patrick. Then I heard the same annoying voice say, It's him, guys. I turned to see who said it, and it was O'Brien. His grinning smile said it all. Molly's face flashed into my mind, and a feeling of horror came over me. I said, Wait, I'm married too, and I'm a policeman. You can't take me away. O'Brien mockingly said, Yes, we can, Buko, and we will. Grab him, guys. With these words, four men in blue grabbed me straight from the police line and began to drag me to the rest of the unfortunates. Now everything was between me and O'Brien. 
My first instinct is always to fight, and I'm stronger than most people. So I was able to free myself and went to O'Brien. I screamed in rage. You're not getting away with this, O'Brien. Where are the New Yorkers? Where are the rich people? You are a traitor to the Irish, O'Brien. You send your people to their deaths. How many silver coins did they give you? The cowardly bastard was hiding behind the police chief. At that moment, a gang of soldiers attacked me. But I saw how the first bricks and stones began to fly. Looks like I started the New York draft riot. The riot lasted two days. I did not know the details of how it happened or who or what was hurt as I was chained and taken to camp a store on Rikers Island. My Irish temperament was boiling, and they kept me in chains until they threw me into a cell. I spent a week in the dark. I was fed once a day. All I thought about was my molly and what would inevitably happen to my bright shining swallow. Seamus O'Brien was not far from my thoughts. I would survive to kill him. Finally, the door opened and a couple of healthy soldiers in striped uniforms dragged me out. I was weak as a kitten by that time, so they had no problem doing this. Several dapper guys examined me while I was hanging by my arms between two jailers. One was in military uniform. He was a neat little man with brown hair and clean shaven. Best of all, he looked smart. It was a contrast to the other guy. I knew him. His name was Jenkins, and he was provost marshal. A man in uniform examined me. It was like buying a horse. He said, I saw what you did at the recruiting meeting. I heard from your boss that you are a good fighter. I said, let me go and you will find out. The man in uniform laughed loudly and said, he'll do. We need people who know how to fight. Two sergeants dragged me to the table. There was paper on the table. Jenkins said, sign your name. I said, I can write. The man in uniform looked surprised. Jenkins said, okay, Spud, sign your name. I said, not until these two let me go. Jenkins said, release the prisoner. As soon as they did, I rushed towards Jenkins, only to be stopped by the sharpened saber against my stomach. The man in uniform held it. He looked very calm and said, sign the paper. I knew I was signing for the entire term. I couldn't protect Molly if I did, but they were going to skewer me like a chicken if I didn't. A little voice in my head said, live to fight another day, Patty. So I signed. At this, the man in uniform, whose name was Merritt, said, escort Mr. Riley to the cars and shackle him there. He has a meeting in Buffalo, and I want him not to miss it. He knew I would jump off the train if I wasn't chained to him, so I rode all the way to Buffalo in a wagon carrying boots and other military supplies. After a day and a half of no sleep, I arrived at an empty site in Rockport. It was a place they derisively called a recruit training camp. While we were passing through the camp, they literally threw me out of the train. I rolled down the slope towards the feet of Sergeant Michael Brennan. He picked me up and said with a big leprechaun smile, Welcome to the army, boy, as he removed my handcuffs. Most of my scandals were knocked out of me. I finally accepted that my life in five points was over, and that, for better or worse, my wife is now in the clutches of a man whose sole purpose was to humiliate me. The only thing that kept me going was killing him in the most creative ways possible. I grieved for Molly. She couldn't write. So we couldn't exchange flowery love letters. None of my friends could read or write either. So there was no point in trying to hold on to my old life. I could have been on the moon like she was. I'm a very strong Irishman. But I cried a lot in the darkest, darkest hours of the night. It was so unfair. I told God he could forget about seeing me at the pearly gates, because any deity that would allow this to happen was not my friend. I made it through because I knew there would be revenge at the end of my rainbow, and the devil was my master. My heart was cruel and cruelty was my best friend. Molly was now too good for me. Brennan dragged me towards a dirty collection of tents. There were three guys in the closest one. None of them looked happy to be here. He said, I'll give you guys a bunk mate, make him feel at home. This must have meant beat up Irish. Like I said, I'm a good fighter. I trained a lot, 
grew up in five points. I'm short, but I have a neck like a bulldog, and the rest of my body is thick and powerful. I can also take a hit. It's because my skull is thick and Irish, and I'm an unattractive wall of muscle. I didn't try to become like that. This has been passed down through generations of Irish potato diggers. I reached an understanding with these guys after they were brought to their senses, so I had a choice of places to lay out my new army blanket. There is also more space there, because the guy whose jaw I hit was sent home. He thanked me for getting him out. I could barely sit on a horse, let alone ride it. The only horses I saw in five points pulled carts, and I didn't fire the weapon. They fixed it all four weeks before we were sent south. Meanwhile, I fell off horses a lot. I hated horses. Most of us were called from the city itself, so I had a lot of company falling off things. But I loved the gun. I had a steady hand and loved the power the gun gave. By the end of the month, I could regularly hit targets at 300 yards. They gave me a sniper medal and sent me south. So I ended up on Dorona's Nag in northern Virginia in the spring of 1865. The 2nd Cavalry Regiment, better known as the Governor's Guard, was not a magnificent cavalry unit. We were a bunch of untrained people ready to fight. We fought on foot, like infantry. So I carried a 58 Springfield rifle with a nearly two-foot bayonet instead of a saber and a fancy Sharps carbine. Our commander was Colonel Fisk. He was a man who often quarreled with his superiors. In short, he looked like me. The man who made me sign the paper commanded the entire brigade. I liked Wesley Merritt. He knew how to fight. And unlike Custer, he seemed to care whether the rest of us survived. For some reason, he loved me too. He made me a sergeant. At twenty years old, I commanded a group of older men. Sometimes I would come across a soldier who couldn't hear very well. Then my fist-fighting skills came in handy. In the two years I spent in the army, I never lost a fight. As a result, the whole company began to respect me, even if I was young. We fought in real battles such as Sylvania Sports, Cold Harbor, Petersburg. But the generals did not know how to use us. We were too much like cavalry to be reliable as infantry, and we were too untrained to be useful in cavalry combat. Most of the time we simply scouted and guarded the rear of those who were actually fighting. What was particularly unfair about my situation was that all the other guys were getting time off to go back and see their families. I've never done this. It was Merritt's idea. He knew I would run away if he ever let me out of the camp. And he was right. The guy who was summoned before me was something of a friend. His name was John Blake, and he was a good, quiet guy, decent and reliable. Before being drafted, he was a mechanic on the docks, and he and his wife Nellie were thinking about buying a house. Fortunately, they lived with Nellie's parents, so she had a place to stay. Molly was all I had and vice versa. Her parents died on the way here, and they found me in a basket in front of the church, so our situation was different. Blake was sent home for a whole week after the failure at Crater. They just laughed when I asked. Maybe it was for the best. Blake returned much sadder. He really missed his wife, but he said she was fine without him. I asked him about Molly. He said he hadn't heard anything about her. I felt like he was hiding something, but I didn't hear anything more from him. Finally, we got an opportunity at a place called Marshall Crossroads. They needed all the cavalry they could get. They found a gap in the enemy line and we rushed through it to surround them. The distance was too great for an infantry march so they called out all the cavalry units of the Army of the Potomac, including us. When we surrounded them, they tried to break through. It was the first time I killed a man in battle. I didn't regret it. It was a Confederate officer. The Confederates tried to break through the cordon around them. They were desperately trying to escape. We stood behind a wooden fence. We got up and fired at them with a volley. The field was shrouded in black gunpowder smoke so visibility was no more than thirty yards. Dull figures appeared from the fog, and we shot them. From such a distance we could not miss. I stood out in the battle, remained standing, and calmly shouted commands for the salvo, load, get ready, fire. I wasn't brave. 
The only reason I did this was because I thought the sooner we got this thing over with, the sooner I could get back to my Molly. But they thought I deserved to be an officer, so I was immediately promoted to lieutenant. I didn't do anything different as a lieutenant, but I got my tent. I was officially an officer in combat for only a week. Then it all ended at Apomatox. It didn't matter. I knew that in the eyes of my betters, I would always be nothing more than Irish trash. But on the other hand, being an officer increased my severance pay since the mounted riflemen caught Wilkes Booth. So we got most of the reward. Maybe when I get back I can buy a real house for Molly. We were demobilized after the usual ceremonies. It was a big parade in Washington, where the great and the good polished their achievements for political growth. I was away from my old life for exactly two years and one month. During all this time I have not heard anything from anyone. I had several friends in the police, but they were as illiterate as Molly, and Blake claimed that Molly had disappeared. Perhaps she lived with one of her many friends. The guys had a farewell party at the National Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. There were toasts in which I did not participate. I nursed the burning ember of resentment. I then took the Baltimore and Ohio train back to New York. It took us nearly three days to get down to Virginia along this line. A day to return. There was no terminal in Manhattan like there is now, so I just jumped down to Paul Hook. The next day the boatman took me to the dock on the Manhattan side. I walked a mile or so from the battery to Five Points. It was a warm sunny day at the end of August. The city was buzzing with excitement, just as I remembered it. I was in full lieutenant's uniform with cavalry yellow stripes. When I got to the old area, people didn't recognize me. This was understandable. If I had been a bit of a difficult case when I left, I was now a completely different person. I was no longer the naive 20-year-old being dragged out of his childhood in chains. I spent two years enduring danger and hardship. I commanded men in battle and killed enemies. Now I was dead on a pale horse, and I was looking for O'Brien. I approached our small hut. My heart was beating in my throat. It has always been a happy place, full of peace, joy, and love. Now it was an abandoned, crumbling house, just like my life. There was nothing inside but the rubbish of cheap whiskey bottles, apparently abandoned by tramps looking for a convenient place to drink. In many ways, the desolation of this place was a perfect analogy for my soul. Molly was nowhere to be seen. I didn't expect her to be there. She needed to live somehow. I didn't know where she was. But I knew where O'Brien lived. He had a beautiful house on Broadway, near Washington Square. It was late evening when I arrived at his door. I could probably finish my business right then and there. I looked confident in my cavalry uniform, even if in reality I was just a mounted infantryman. But I didn't want to be hanged. So I wanted fewer witnesses. I was just hanging around, doing reconnaissance. I wanted to understand the daily routine. Normally I might seem suspicious to the neighbors, but I got a lot of approving looks. They liked the shape. Finally, evening came. The street lights were on. I was across the street from O'Brien's house, just watching the traffic in and out of the house. Many politicians, whose faces I knew, came to kiss the great man's ring, or any part of his anatomy he desires. There was movement there, and a beautiful carriage arrived. The front door of the house opened, and O'Brien came out. He was dressed in a top hat and tails, apparently ready for a night on the town. There was an absolutely stunning woman on his arm. She was dressed up for the evening, wearing a tight emerald green dress that contrasted beautifully with her luscious copper curls. The dress showed off a gorgeous pair of breasts. I'll check it out thoroughly. She was my wife. That explained everything. Now she didn't at all resemble my bright bird. She was a dressed-up lady of New York society. O'Brien put his arm around Molly's waist as the slimy Irish bastard escorted her to the carriage. She pressed herself close to him. She looked calm, relaxed, and content. Seeing this annoying sight, I felt nothing. No jealousy or anger. I've cried enough to reach a state of insensitivity. At least now I knew Molly was okay. She will soon inherit a lot of money. I was there all day, watching. I counted four servants in the house, a butler, two maids, and a cook. 
three women and one elderly man. The rest of the large household apparently came to work during the day. I knocked on the door after everyone had left. The old butler opened it. I hoped the maids had already gone to bed. I didn't want them to see what was going to happen. It will be terrible. The butler examined my full uniform and military posture and said disdainfully, Master at the symphony, he will see you in the morning. He was used to turning down people who were much more important than a humble cavalry lieutenant. He started to close the door. I stopped her with my foot and said in my most commanding voice, This can't wait, buddy. This comes straight from General Wool. I have to deliver it tonight. Wool was suspended immediately after the riot. I did not know that. Luckily, the butler didn't know either. The man began to object. So I said sternly, I just told you, friend, it should be delivered tonight. I added threateningly, not expecting any objection. Shall I wait in his office? And pushed past him. The butler was an old man. He reluctantly moved away and pointed to a room that was slightly more luxurious than Lincoln's. I entered, turned to him, and said imperiously, Send him to me as soon as he arrives. Then I slammed the door and began to explore the office. O'Brien has really succeeded, that's for sure. I didn't realize how big until I opened his bottom desk drawer and discovered a huge leather bag full of golden eagles. She just lay there as if money meant nothing to him. This must have been O'Brien's stash. It was a huge fortune. I put it in my bag. On top of my severance pay, I had a huge pile of cash. O'Brien returned home three hours later. I sat in his luxurious leather chair, smoked one of his expensive cigars, and enjoyed his Napoleon brandy. The rest of his cigars were in my pocket. I heard a loud, irritated voice in the hall and the respectful response of the butler. He said loudly, I'll be up soon, dear, as soon as I throw out this intruder. We still have unfinished business tonight. The implication of this caused a real stab of pain. I guess my heart wasn't as cruel as I thought. But that sealed the bastard's fate. He swung the door open and walked into the room like a bear with a pain in the ass. I sat relaxed in his chair, my feet on his table, smoking his cigar and holding a glass of good brandy in my left hand. But what caught his attention was the large army colt I was holding in my right hand. I said, close the door, Seamus, and sit down. We really need to catch up. His eyes narrowed, his face darkened with anger, and he looked like he was about to explode. I made a close-the-door gesture with the gun. There was something in my eyes that convinced him to do it. He came to confront me. I looked at him calmly. What I lived for was going to happen. I was completely calm. Then he recognized me. His eyes rolled out and his face showed horror. He plopped down on a chair and said pleadingly, Now, now, don't do anything you'll regret, Pat. I said, what would that be, Seamus? Do you think I will regret killing the man who sent me to slaughter and then stole my wife? He said smoothly, Now, Pat, you know it was just one of those things. You damaged me. I damaged you. It's over now. We are even. We can shake hands and go on our way. It was funny. O'Brien has always been an Irish politician. The assumption was so absurd. I threw my head back and laughed out loud but the pistol did not flinch. I killed good people in the war. I didn't have the slightest doubt about killing this piece of shit. I said conversationally, are you going to come upstairs after I leave? Molly is a great lover, isn't she, Seamus? How long did you wait? I saw it in his eyes. But he was still looking for a way out. He looked exactly like a cornered rat. He said, trying to sound noble. After you left, the poor girl was left without care. I just did the Christian thing and took her in. I can't help it if she has a crush on me. I believed him. Molly was simple-minded at heart. She relied on people to take care of her. I guess she was more than grateful when O'Brien showed up on her doorstep. I also imagined that it didn't take long for him to seduce her into his bed. Molly has always been a hot Irish girl. I said, When did you tell her I was dead? He looked miserable as he said, after the Sylvania spot, there was another Patrick Riley on the list of dead. He thought he saw a ray of hope. 
He added, We all thought it was you, Pat. I was just taking care of your widow. No offense, right? My eyes told him that I knew it was nonsense. I said, When did you two get married? He said, We got married straight after that. It was in church, so it's legal and all. You were declared dead. I thought, this declaration would not be difficult for O'Brien to arrange through his political friends. Now this will provide Molly with wealth. I said wearily, Well, that's all in the past, Seamus. I really wish I could stay and make your death long and painful. But I have a train, so I guess I'll have to get to work. Any last words? He said, Please, Pat. He had tears in his eyes. The guy really wanted to live. But of course, he was rich and influential. Even better, he had the most beautiful woman in New York. I understood, if I had Molly, I would want to live too. But I didn't have it. She was now O'Brien's wife, so it was time for him to leave. It was ironic. It only took a determined man and a gun to bring down his empire. I said, see you in hell, Seamus. I stood up and calmly packed the bottle of brandy into my bag. I placed it next to the heavy bag of gold. My heart became lighter. Then there was a frantic noise in the hall, and the door swung open. She stood there in a nightgown and long black stockings. She looked gorgeous and scared. The room was full of smoke from my cigar and gunpowder. She covered her mouth with both hands in horror. Then her eyes, full of panic, turned to me. I said ironically, Hello, Molly, my dear. I returned from the war. Did you miss me? At first she looked confused. Then her look changed to completely stunned when she recognized me. She whispered weakly, But, but you're dead. Then her beautiful emerald eyes rolled back and she fainted. I looked down at her gorgeous body. A brutal wave of regret washed over me. It was so heartbreaking that I almost fainted too. But I heard the old butler begin to move below. So instead, I walked out into the night carefully closing the office door behind me. I needed to get to the New Jersey side before the hype started. This will require stealing the boat, but there were a lot of boats at the piers at the battery. I wanted to stay and hold her, love her, and tell her everything was okay. But that's not true. She betrayed me, even if she was deceived about it. Now she was the widow of my hated enemy, and she will inherit the O'Brien fortune, thanks to me. Now I was free. I accomplished what I came for. Molly may not have been able to read, but she was smart. She would lose her inheritance if she told the authorities that I did it. So she had a million reasons to come up with a story about a mysterious killer. I was the nameless ghost of former Lieutenant Patrick Timothy Riley. I had pockets full of cigars, a huge bag of gold coins, and a significant severance package. I was only 20 years old, and I thought I would try my luck in the West. A new man appeared when I pulled the trigger. It was like death and rebirth. Even in my deepest despair, on rainy nights in Virginia, I held on to the hope of resuming my old life with the woman I loved. Knowing that Molly had spent all this time enjoying herself with the man who sent me to the slaughterhouse would have killed me, literally. No wonder Blake kept his mouth shut. I knew she had been deceived. Molly was sweet and beautiful but she was also simple and trusting. Her naivety didn't change anything about my current situation. The undeniable fact was that I was now on my own. Some men might cry, others might be sad. I just became tougher and more ruthless. It was like all the joy of life and my humanity evaporated out of me. The West was a vast expanse, full of nothing but buffalo and Indians. It seemed like the perfect place for a man who wanted nothing to do with humanity. After O'Brien's murder, I listened to the news for several weeks. I wanted to know if I would be persecuted. Eventually, I learned that O'Brien's widow told police that she witnessed a foreigner kill her husband and then disappear into the night. That settled the matter. I will never know whether Molly protected me out of greed or residual loyalty. But I cherished the idea that she did it out of love. Now I was Timothy O'Hara, an Irishman who had made a lot of money in the Boston bar industry and wanted to make even more in the Wild West. I went by rail to St. Louis. It only took two days. 
This was an amazing achievement in the modern world of steam. I bought a good horse in St. Louis. It cost me a fair amount of O'Brien's wealth. But the horse was young and strong and could walk all day at a moderate pace. After two years in the mounted infantry, I became a good horseman, even if I was a city boy. I could also sleep under any tree where I could lay out a blanket. I didn't know what I would do, maybe join the prospectors in California. It was more a direction than an intention. I already had a huge fortune in gold thanks to O'Brien. I realized everything while driving down to St. Louis. I was numb when I left New York, but green jealousy was devouring me now. I couldn't stop thinking that Molly slept with O'Brien. I never had parents. I was raised in the harsh conditions of an orphanage. By the age of 17, my fist-fighting skills were obvious to everyone. Tammany ran the police force, so they used it. They made me a policeman. Working the streets of Five Points, you quickly learn to trust no one but yourself. The first time I saw Molly was while I was patrolling my area. She was with a group of Irish washerwomen. She stood out among the others like a swan among geese. Her fiery red hair and laughing green eyes, as well as her perfect round figure, were like a beacon calling to me. I knew I could love and trust this woman. Our marriage was predetermined. I never doubted her throughout our marriage. Although I knew about her high sexuality, other men tried, but she was a devoted, loyal, and supportive wife. However, I thought that her bottomless passions might turn against us if we were ever separated. O'Brien stole it because he could. I knew Molly believed I was dead. I suppose she grieved for a while, as all widows do. But Molly was a simple woman, and she had deep desires. She loved with all her heart and gave herself completely to her man. So she gave herself to O'Brien. I knew that O'Brien's betrayal was the reason for her downfall. He was a dishonest and cunning bastard. He quickly took advantage of Molly, that is, as soon as he arranged my death. So it should have been easy for me to forgive her, but I couldn't. Likewise, killing O'Brien was not enough to heal my mortal wound. The pain of loss sat at the bottom of my soul and festered. It was fate, and now there was nothing I could do about it. Consequently, I was a gloomy man when I went west. I was traveling alone. I hated the world. I had no direction. I just wanted to get away from my old life. Maybe someday I can forget. The Oregon Trail was the recognized route to the Golden West. The problem was that he crossed Indian territory, and by 1866 the Indians were greatly resenting our presence. I drove all over Kansas and made it to Omaha on my own. Now it was logical to join one of the caravans. This was mainly for self-defense, because sometimes large groups of Indians appeared while we were bumping along the road. The carts were moving much slower than I was, but there was safety in numbers. The caravan I joined was glad to have an experienced person. Two years in the mounted infantry gave me the skills I needed. I knew how to handle a gun and could ride and scout. Reconnaissance was basically what riflemen did in war. The horizons to the west were disconcerting, but I had come a long way from the crowded streets and slums of lower Manhattan. I could describe the topography and threats to the carrier. I knew how to handle a pistol and a shotgun. I had no doubt about the murder. I could ride as if I had been born on a horse, even sleep on it while she walked slowly. Plus, I'm used to living on the ground and in any weather. Soldiers, especially conscripts, were not particularly indulged in Mr. Bind Lincoln's army. The cavalry taught me all this. I was built like a bull, strawberry red hair and freckles, with a long classic Irish face, wide-set blue eyes, a thin nose, high cheekbones, and a strong chin, better able to withstand blows. My mouth conveyed all the irony and slyness of the Irish soul. I smiled a lot, but it never reached my eyes. The rest of me was pure skin and bones. I ate a lot, but I trained even more. It was natural living on a horse. I found it ironic that the former Five Points Bandit was a scout for the caravans, but it also served my purposes. The main thing is that I didn't want to be around anyone else. Driving forward meant that I only came to camp at night. The emigrant route generally followed the course of the Platte River through Nebraska Territory. 
It was used as an improved route for 20 years. It crossed the lands of the Sioux and Cheyenne until it reached Oregon Territory west of Fort Laramie. By 1866, many branches had appeared, which mainly led to gold mining towns that appeared in Colorado and Nevada. My job was to scout each one to see where the best paths and terrain were. I found a young couple that I could stand, or perhaps more accurately, who could stand me. They let me spread a blanket under their wagon. I also put an army rubber blanket under my bed. Thus, I was completely protected from the elements while I slept. The guy's name was Ezekiel, or Zeke. He wasn't in the war. I was. So he seemed like a boy to me, although in fact he was a couple of years older. He was one of a dozen children on a farm in Ohio. His old man gave him a Conestoga wagon and sent him west with his blessing. This meant that the family had one less mouth to feed. His wife was a good German girl. She had blonde hair and a pretty face. She had one of those attractive bodies, all breasts and hips. It was as if her body was asking to be loved. She was also the reason I left the caravan. The trail crossed many rivers, which we either had to wade or cross by ferry. In fact, there were so many rivers that ferries were big business back then. We waited for the Green River to calm down. The Green River is a major tributary of the Colorado and can be pretty damn tricky to cross. In places where it could be forded, after the spring rains it became too deep for a Conestoga wagon. I have just returned from a reconnaissance on the other side of the river and told the leader of the caravan that we could cross it tomorrow. It was already late for the settlers and I was tired, so I unrolled my blankets, rested my head on the saddlebags, and placed my trusty army colt nearby. I never wanted to leave these bags unattended. They were my future. I had a Henry rifle, but I also had a Hawken rifle. This was for long-range shooting. The Hawken rifle cost me a significant amount of money from the O'Brien estate. It was a muzzle-loading weapon, not a repeating weapon, but it was deadly in my hands, even at 600 yards. They were always in a holster on my saddle. I was becoming a real master with the Colt. This was my weapon of choice. I practiced a lot, paying only for gunpowder. Colt didn't use cartridges like the Henry rifle, so ammo was cheap. I became so good that I could shoot and kill a prairie dog, a coyote, or a rattlesnake in one smooth motion. I could do the same with a person if necessary. One night I felt the urge to relieve myself, so I went to the nearest buffalo. I was just finishing the last few movements when someone hugged me. I almost jumped out of my skin. There were a lot of wild people who could have stuck a knife in for nothing. I turned around with lightning speed, and there stood Gretchen. She stepped back, stunned. I looked into her cornflower blue eyes, full of passion. I didn't think twice about it. I've had women since Molly. These were mostly women of easy virtue. But I also slept with several Indian girls. Indians do not have puritanical prejudices like white girls, so they were an adventure, even if they smelled like bare grease. But I had to go back three and a half years to remember what a truly great body looked like. I found that the women you sleep with are much more appreciative if you act like a gentleman. So I said, You're welcome, dear lady, and pointed to the nearby grass, which the buffalo had turned into a soft bed. We had sex. She stood up and, without saying a word, put on her modest cotton nightgown and walked back into the darkness towards the van. We barely exchanged words the entire time we were together. It was probably the weirdest lovemaking I've ever had. We did it almost every night after that. Gretchen was an amazing lover. But other than these moments, we acted as if we didn't know each other. The caravan finally made it to Roland's. Chappie Clayton, who was the leader of the caravan, met me when I arrived from reconnaissance. We were a little ahead of the caravan itself. He said, You were a good scout, Tim, so I'll give you fair warning. Some guys are going to kill you if you go back to the vans. He didn't need to say why. I was exposed. I didn't know what was going on with Gretchen. But she wasn't my problem. She started it. I thought that a girl with her abilities would probably convince her husband to believe any story she came up with. Without saying a word, I nodded, turned my horse and said, Thanks for the warning, Chappie. I then headed towards Yellowstone Country. 
I spent the next couple of months moving up the Yellowstone River. I didn't want to cross the mountains to the west, and the company of caravans was enough for me. The Great Plains were terrible, too dry at times and too wet at others, too hot and too windy, and the horizon was endless. I loved the beauty of the area along the Yellowstone River, but the leaves were turning yellow and winter was approaching. I needed a place to wait it out. They found gold along Grasshopper Creek, north of the Yellowstone River. I had enough gold as I needed, but someone had founded a town along the Bozeman Trail, which was ideally suited to serve the crowd of would-be prospectors heading to the gold fields of western Montana. The town itself was pretty rough. He was five years old, and there were a lot of different people there from cowboys to sharpers, from eastern newcomers to businessmen, and even some foreigners who came to hunt and fish. It seemed like the perfect place for an Irishman named Timothy O'Hara. I wanted to see what opportunities Patrick might find in a thriving ranching town like Bozeman, so I decided to go there. There were many Indians in Yellowstone. They didn't bother me. By that time, I had already mastered their sign language and spoke a little of the Cheyenne language. They were decent people if you didn't bother them. They had their own military societies, such as the dog soldiers. I had to stay away from them. But I've been in the wild long enough to know all the rules of the wilderness. I sometimes went into their villages to exchange for pemmican or some black powder. It was in one of these villages that I first saw Anavao. This northern Shushan word means beautiful girl, and it suited her perfectly. To me, there are two types of Cheyenne women. Most of them have moon-shaped faces with high cheekbones, almost oriental eyes and prominent noses, or they have long, oval faces. Combined with the same high cheekbones and eyes, these types of faces can be exotically, stunningly beautiful. Anovo has taken this concept to its absolute extreme. She had an incredibly beautiful face with satiny skin. Combined with her wide, sensual mouth, her unusual, very fair skin tone, and her perfectly proportioned features, she had an almost unreal aesthetic appeal. Her body was slender and panther-like, with full and firm breasts atop a long waist and long legs. To me, she was even more beautiful than Molly. When I first saw her, I just stopped and stared. I asked the man with whom I was bargaining, Who is this? He spoke decent English. But he used a Cheyenne word, which meant unwanted or sometimes unclean. I asked, she's beautiful. Why do you call her that? My friend said, she's not one of us. Her father was a white man. I understood what he meant. The white man meant that, despite her stunning beauty, Anawawo was not fat Cheyenne. They accepted her into the tribe. But it was very difficult for a young girl to grow up with the stigma of white blood. I completed my transaction, packed the pemmican in my saddlebags, and left the village. As I was leaving, I met the eyes of a woman. She washed her clothes in the river. She looked at me, full of grief and despair. I almost fell off my horse. Her eyes were bright blue. No wonder she had a hard time fitting in. I almost stopped to talk to her. But I realized that this would violate all social norms of the Cheyenne culture, and would likely result in her being challenged to a duel and killed by her husband or father. So I moved on. A few days later, I was moving up the Gallatin River in the direction where I had heard Bozeman was. It was a beautiful autumn day in the highlands. All the trees were in their brightest colors, and the air was fresh. Geese flew overhead, and there was a hint of approaching winter in the air. I had just started walking along the path along the river bank when I heard a noise on the other side. It was in a grove of red and yellow leaves to my right. The noise was accompanied by a muffled cry of despair. It was a woman's scream. I quickly crossed the shallow river and headed straight into a grove of poplars. There were three people there. They kidnapped a woman. They stopped laughing when the bullet hit the ground in front of them. Their horses neighed in fear and reared up. The cowboys took little time to calm them down, then both turned to me with anger. I said in a voice as calm as death, Where are you guys going with this woman? The first of them said angrily, It's none of your business, and pulled out his Remington. I killed them. The girl fell to the ground in a weeping heap of deerskin. It is clear that these two have captured her. 
they took her back to their lair for some fun, and then, most likely, they would have killed her. After all, she was just a turkey. Numerous highland scum believed that Indian women were easy prey, and they never understood why the Indians were hostile. I dismounted and approached the woman, trying to look as unthreatening as possible, even though I probably looked like Satan in leather to her. I had no experience dealing with crying women. In fact, I'd rather deal with a rattlesnake. But this woman was now my concern. I sat down next to her and said, It's okay, little lady. You are safe. These two scoundrels went to their creator. All I want is to return you to your people. She stopped crying for a second and looked at me. Her eyes were a stunning bright blue. It hit me like lightning. This piteously crying girl was a woman from the village. I started making gestures to show that I was a friend. She said wearily, I speak English. Of course she did. Her father must have been a trapper or traitor. I said, where are your people? I can take you back to them. She began to regain her composure. The speed of her recovery was miraculous. After all, she should have known what awaited her if I had not come. This showed great personal strength. She said wearily, They don't want me. I was digging roots when these two captured me. It wasn't that far from the village. Nobody even came for me. Now I'm all alone. And she started crying again. Well, that made it two of us. We were both outcasts for reasons beyond our control. So we will have to face the world alone, but together. She began to tremble, crying. This was partly due to shock, partly due to the cold. I took my blanket from the back of the saddle. He returned and wrapped her up. She looked at me gratefully. Her eyes were strikingly beautiful and incredibly intelligent. I made a split-second decision. Partly it was out of compassion, but also because I felt an inexplicable attachment to this woman. There was just an incredible feeling of attraction. This was more than I had ever felt for anyone, not even Molly. She attracted me. Maybe it was her dazzling beauty. Maybe it's her obvious intelligence. She spoke excellent English and radiated determination and strength. Maybe it's her courage. Most women facing violence, torture, and death would be hysterical. This woman was crying, but she was still in control. I said carefully, You are not alone. I will take care of you until you can return to your tribe. Her look of pure relief and gratitude told me how she felt about it. Her captor's horses ran away. So we only had my horse. I didn't want to bore her. So I walked and Anavao rode. Like all Cheyennes, she rode as if she were part of a horse. She wore a beautiful deerskin dress with intricate embroidery and feathers and sturdy moccasins. The dress hugged her gorgeous body. It also refuted all ideas about the Cheyenne as savages. It was not just a piece of clothing. It was a work of art worthy of being exhibited in any museum in the world. I asked her if she knew where her tribe was. She said she was part of the Black Kettle Gang, and that they sometimes went south for the winter. That's all she knew. There was a lot of empty space in the West, so it didn't help much. I asked, How did you end up separated? She said, I was digging commas in the field across the river. I was alone because none of the other women wanted to work with me. Commas was a root that was a staple food for the Cheyenne, but it was difficult to find at this time of year. She added, they must have been hiding in the tree line. They drove up to me, grabbed me, and stole me. They drove all day. I think they wanted to get as far away from my village as possible. But they didn't touch me. One of them stopped to relieve himself. I tried to escape, and then you showed up. I asked, so your gang could be miles away? She nodded dejectedly. The solution was obvious. I said, you can come with me. I'm going to a place called Bozeman. I'm going to spend the winter there. You can stay with me, and in the spring we'll find your group. She understood that I was offering salvation. She said in a voice full of gratitude, I am a good worker. You will never regret taking me in. We camped the first night near a small stream. I followed Gallatin because it led straight to Bozeman. We hardly spoke. We were both loners for our own reasons but the connection between us was so strong that it was almost tangible. I have never felt more well-being in my life 
even with Molly. This woman, Anavuo, seemed to complete me. I became whole again. She looked at me through the fire. Her eyes were shining. Those eyes and her beautiful face were breathtaking. She was light-skinned for an Indian. Of course, the Caucasian blood, of which she was so ashamed, had some influence. Her eyes were huge with long, thick eyelashes. The intense blue color was probably the result of her mixed heritage. But I have never seen such eyes before or since. Her hair was thick and soft. She wore it in a braid that reached down to her buttocks. She was probably younger than me, but it was difficult to determine. The Cheyenne do not use calendars. She had a beautifully proportioned body, full where it needed to be and slim everywhere else. Everything about her walk reminded me of the perfect symmetry and balance of big mountain cats. I asked, what are you thinking about? She replied, I was just thinking how noble and beautiful you are. I laughed heartily and said, you don't need to flatter me. I'll take care of you anyway. She glared and said, I will always be honest with you. I will work hard for you. You will never regret having me as your woman. Okay, it's all over now. She declared herself to be my woman. For the Cheyenne, this meant that I would feed and protect her. In return, she will serve me with her entire life. If sex was part of it, it was just part of the service. I've had a lot of women. So why didn't I sleep with Anavuo on the spot? Because her situation was completely different. I felt a deep tenderness for her, and this feeling scared me to death. In less than 24 hours, this girl had broken through all my defenses and taken deep root in my heart. I don't understand how a woman born and raised in an Indian tribe and an Irishman from the wildest parts of lower Manhattan could connect with each other like that. But I felt closer to Anavuo than I ever did to Molly. If you want to call it love at first sight, so be it. So there was a lot more involved than just sex. If we got together, it could only be out of love. I only loved one woman, Molly, and it ended very badly. I lost her to fate and an evil man. The last thing I wanted to do was tempt the gods by falling in love with a refugee from a foreign culture. It was my instinct. But there was an attraction, and we both felt it. I pushed all these hesitations away as I tried to fall asleep. It became colder as the night progressed. She was wrapped in my blanket, her teeth chattering. But she didn't complain. I was freezing to death, lying on my rubber mat without shelter. I thought, this is stupid, and patted the ground next to me. She happily moved over to me, snuggled up to me, pulled the blanket over us, and sighed with contentment. Then she fell asleep. However, in the middle of the night I had to go behind a beech tree and release my tension. When I woke up, she was swimming naked in the river. I later learned that Anavuo bathes every day. She sang a cheerful little song while she washed herself. She carefully rubbed her raven hair with the bouquet of lavender she had collected. That explained why they were so silky and smelled so good. Washing took some time because her hair was very thick and fell all the way to her butt. She stood with her back to me. I admired her. Then she turned. It was an amazing sight. Her body was perfect. She looked pleased. She said, You're awake. She walked towards me, dripping, unashamed, and just absolutely beautiful. Indians do not have the same complexes about their bodies as white people. So she was superbly natural, without the slightest embarrassment. She walked past me and bent down to pick up her dress. Seeing this didn't help my condition. I thought to myself, Lord, give me strength. We had breakfast with the supplies I bought from her village but I quickly realized the value of Anavuo's legacy. I shot a rabbit early in the morning during our journey. I left Anavuo at our evening camp while I tied, fed, and groomed the horse. We needed to take very good care of this animal. It made our journey much easier, because it carried all our supplies and, of course, Anavuo. When I returned, Anavuo was nowhere to be found. I started to panic. Then I caught the delicious smell of something cooking in the low, growing cottonwoods. I went there with a grin on my face. She sat down, tending to our dinner. She looked at me happily and said, Okay, you're back. I just finished setting up our camp. I was only gone for 45 minutes. 
During this time, Anavuo gathered wood, built a fire, skinned the rabbit, and began to cook it, dug up some commas to accompany our food, and placed a fresh layer of leaves and twigs next to the fire as a soft base for our blankets. Her eye for the area was excellent. We were completely hidden from everyone, so we were safe. But we were also above the surrounding ground in case of rain. I thought to myself, any other woman I know would just sit there and wait for me to do all this. Anavuo made our life pleasant and comfortable throughout the entire trip. We were both people who valued privacy, so we didn't talk much. But we felt an intense attraction to each other. We told our stories along the way. She told me about her life. She was part of the Black Cauldron group, famous pragmatist and a peacemaker among the Cheyenne, even after half his group was killed in the Sand Creek Massacre. Anavuo escaped the massacre because she was visiting her half-brother on the Crow Reservation. Her father was everywhere. White blood usually complicates life in any tribe. But she said the Black Cauldron was different. He accepted it when all the other groups refused. He was very kind to her, and she loved him like a father. She revealed that the Black Cauldron was more of a diplomat than a military leader, preferring negotiations to military action. But the white men tried tirelessly to drive the Cheyenne into a dry and barren reservation, far from the buffalo. Since bison were the lifeblood of the Cheyenne, this forced her group to move further and further south. This is what they did when they captured her. Anavuo knew nothing about world events. She knew only the simple world of her village. Perhaps I would have been like her if I had not been taken to war. But ever since I saw the elephant, I knew that we were both part of changing realities in the West. This change would ultimately destroy all aspects of traditional Cheyenne life and culture. Bozeman sits on a high plateau between several high mountain ranges. Most of these mountains contain gold. Therefore, Bozeman was the starting point for every old prospector, new miner, and dubious speculator. When I arrived, I saw that it was also an ideal place to settle down and earn some money. O'Brien's gold will come in handy here. Bozeman had been laid out five years before our arrival, and it had a reputation for being a wild and lawless place, especially after the herds began to be driven along the Bozeman Trail. Every cattle town attracts its share of crooks, ne'er-do-wells, gunslingers, and bad actors. But Bozeman was also key to control of the Yellowstone Territory, so the army established Fort Ellis, three miles from the city. The fort's goal was to take control of the entire region. I wandered around the new fort looking for opportunities. There were infantry and five companies of the 2nd Cavalry. The 2nd included my old part after the war, and I thought I might know some of the guys. I was walking along the parade ground when I heard a joyful cry, Pat. I didn't realize it was referring to me since my name has been Time for the last three years. Then a strong soldier ran up to me and grabbed my hand. He looked delighted. I was stunned. I said, John, John Blake, how the hell are you doing, boy? I'm not a person who likes to communicate. In fact, I try to avoid talking to people. But Blake was a good guy, and he was a friend during the war, so we chatted a little while standing there. He had the same problem as me. He returned home to find that his wife Nellie had caught a fever and died. This happened no more than a week before his release. He said that the feeling of injustice and loss almost killed him, and he decided that he no longer had a reason to live. Therefore, he decided to stay in the army. At least it was square food and work. He was now a sergeant. He said, You heard that Seamus O'Brien was killed in his own home. It was a Russian anarchist who did it. I lit a candle in the Church of the Assumption for him. I could tell from the tone of Blake's voice that he was commemorating the anarchist, not O'Brien. Blake added, puzzled. They gave all his money to his wife, Molly O'Brien. Funny, I thought she was your wife. I put my arm around his shoulder and said conspiratorially, She's still mine, mate, but I'm officially dead. I'm much better off with the new woman. She makes Molly look like a fishmonger from Dublin. We broke up. But Blake gave me an idea. He said that there were no captains in the fort. I had a big bag of money to buy provisions and other goods. 
All I had to do was convince Colonel Brackett to let me sell it to the people, and I could double O'Brien's bid. You may have to hand over some gold, but I knew I could do it. I thought about this as I returned to find Anavuo. I thought I could buy Conestoga from one of the immigrants. Some moved back after seeing how high the mountains were or simply settled where they were. I could load her with all sorts of tempting things and roll her up to the fort gates. I was a soldier. I knew what the cavalry would sell. My only problem was getting supplies to sell. But there were regular steamships to Yellowstone, and I could deliver things on the far west. It was a paddle steamer that delivered goods to the army. Meanwhile, Anavuo visited the Cheyenne camp. The Indians gathered around the fort, hoping that the army would protect them from the local white settlers. The settlers looked for any excuse to exterminate the Cheyenne because they considered them outsiders. The army was no better than the settlers in terms of attitude. They considered all Indians to be warlike. But politics in Washington dictated that the army carry out its duties. Thus, a tense truce existed between the Indians and the soldiers. This was based on each side pretending that the other did not exist. I needed a base. I lost all illusions about life as soon as I saw O'Brien and Molly together. It's easier to just drift if you have gold in your saddlebag. But sooner or later the money will run out. So it was time to think about the future, and Bozeman seemed as good a place as any. Anavuo managed to sow a small seed of optimism. We finally made love and it was as spiritually uplifting as I imagined. This happened as we were heading north, and it was natural and spontaneous. I shot a buffalo, which was no feat of marksmanship. Since there were about 700 bison just standing in the herd, it would have been harder to miss. Then, in half a day, Anavuo transformed the creature into tasty supplies, useful tools, and a waterproof sleeping blanket. She did this using only my bowie knife. So now we no longer slept in a blanket that smelled like horses. The following week, I added black bear to our supply. Thanks to Anavuo, our bed at night was now as splendid as at a store. Despite the fact that frosts began to appear and snow was falling in the high mountains, under all these animal skins, it was warm and cozy. In fact, it was so warm that we started sleeping naked. The first night, this was enough. There was no hesitation. She must have spent her entire life completely alone. Her strange blue eyes made her stand out, and despite how beautiful and capable she was, she could never be fully accepted by the people around her. She must have been trying to fit in, did everything she could as a Cheyenne woman to please the members of her tribe. She must have worked harder than others, been more considerate of her elders, and obedient and responsive to the men in her life but there was always this feeling that she was not completely Cheyenne. I understood how she felt. In everyone else's minds, I was an Irish bastard. I saw it in the way they treated me. To activists and snobs, I was a drunk and a bully, lazy and inactive, no matter how sober I was or how hard I worked. They were more than happy to use my muscles to keep them safe, but they didn't want me in their neighborhoods or saloons. People like O'Brien were successful but they did not receive invitations to Vanderbilt's fancy dress ball, so I knew what meaningless prejudices were. Anavuo's soul was open to me, and I felt only tenderness and care. I felt her desire to please one person, and I instinctively knew that I could trust this man with my heart. She could be from a completely different world, with a completely different set of life experiences. But we were essentially the same person. She will always be my other half, and will never betray me. I said what he knew was true. I love you, Anavuo, I will love you forever. We will die in each other's arms. Promise me that. She looked at me just as lovingly and said, I have been looking for you all my life. I have finally found you. I will bear your children and take care of you. I will never leave you. Thus Patty and the Indian girl were forever bound under the brilliant stars of the high plains. It was as binding a promise as any made before the Pope, and the surrounding mountains, pine trees, and endless sky were a much grander scene than St. Peter's Basilica. We spent the winter in a Cheyenne village, because I didn't want to stay in Bozeman itself. This was caused by an incident that occurred the day after our arrival. 
The Cheyennes had no problem accommodating us for the night. Hospitality towards strangers is part of their culture. But we needed another horse, so Anavuo and I went into town to buy one. There was a stable there, which was basically just a shed and paddock. They kept a herd of horses there. Most of them arrived with the cattle drive as spare ones. I found a suitable chestnut horse. She was big, healthy, and on the decent side of youth. I came in to find out how much they wanted it. It was an elderly man sitting on a barrel. He was telling something to two other guys who looked like they could be his sons. They were all dirty, unshaven, and unkempt. I said, how much for the chestnut one? The man looked at Anavuo with pure contempt and said, get that bitch out of here. We don't serve savages in this establishment. My Irish temperament skyrocketed, but I needed a horse. So I looked around skeptically at this collection of boards which he called the establishment and said softly, I'll give you fifty dollars in gold for it, saddle and all. The guy stood up from the barrel and both other guys approached him. He said, we don't sell to Indians and their lovers. I took out a bag of gold coins that I had brought with me and said, okay, then we have a deal and threw it to him. He instinctively grabbed it. The deal was complete. So I hit him. I pulled out my 44 and said, Now, which one of you guys wants to write me a bill of sale? They saw that I would gladly shoot both of them, so they helped me out of this place with great zeal. I was even happier leaving this city. I didn't need anyone except Anavuo. So parting with this crowd of ignoramuses and scoundrels was not difficult. I bought some canvas at the fort, and some Cheyennes helped set up the tippy. Anavuo made it a warm and cozy home for the winter. It snowed, and we quickly became part of life in that village. For the first time in four years, I was happy and content living with the woman I love. Anavuo spoiled me as faithfully and diligently as any Indian woman cares for her man. Anavuo's physical beauty made us talk of the Cheyenne camp. As a result, sometimes a warrior would come to us to ask how much I wanted for it. It was funny, actually. The Indians did not understand Western concepts of marriage and adultery. In fact, it was simple hospitality to offer his wife for the night. I was never afraid of losing Anavuo. First of all, she was devoted to me, and I was devoted to her. Therefore, regardless of cultural norms, we were extremely attached to each other. In fact, Anavuo she became very restless if I left her alone. I think this was a consequence of her harsh life growing up. She was terrified that I would leave her for a white woman. Of course, this was completely ridiculous. Anavuo was the sweetest, smartest, and most beautiful woman I have ever known, whether white, red, or any other color of the rainbow. Therefore, we were rarely separated. But I remember one incident that winter. It served as confirmation of her absolute devotion to me. I drove into town to complete the purchase of the Conestoga and Harness. When I returned, I saw Anavuo and the warrior arguing bitterly. I didn't need to understand Cheyenne to understand what was going on. He tried to do what was common in that village, spend a winter day making love to her. She tried to stick my bowie knife into him. I arrived just as she was reaching for sharps. The poor guy just wanted to hush up the conflict. I explained this to her. She was still furious. She blurted out, He tried to make love to me. I told him that I am your woman and that only you have the right to my body. He accused me of adopting the customs of white people. She charged sharps and said, I told him I don't care about white or Indian customs. I'll kill him. My reaction was to laugh, taking the weapon off her. Anavuo was still seething like an angry wild cat. She looked so brave and fiery that I wanted her right there in front of the tippy. I waved for the guy to leave. He ran away. Then I took my brave and beautiful wife into our home and helped her vent her anger. Colonel Brackett and several of his men finally came to discuss the incident in the paddock. I presented the bill of sale which showed that I had paid a fair price for the horse. I told him that a man had insulted my wife and what did he expect. I mentioned my service in the Mounted Rifle Division. I then offered him one hundred of O'Brien's Golden Eagles so that he would allow me to open the captain's office at the fort. The colonel decided that I was indeed worthy of the 2nd Cavalry 
and carefully accepted my small bag of coins for consideration. Now all I had to do was organize the rest of the enterprise. Nothing more was heard from my friends from the stables, maybe because I told them I would kill them if I ever saw them again, and they knew I was serious. The Great Northern Railroad had a branch line to Bismarck, and the Far West carried ammunition, thence up the Yellowstone to Fort Ellis. So it was a matter of making the right connections in Chicago and Minneapolis, and I was in on it. The only dark cloud on our horizon was the news that last November Custer had stumbled upon the village of Black Kettle on the banks of the Washita River in Indian Territory. He used cannons and his entire regiment to destroy all 250 of its inhabitants. I never served under Custer, thank God. He didn't care what happened to the rest of his units, as long as he got good mentions in the newspapers. But we all knew that he was a vain fool. So what he did was not unexpected. His victory made him a big hero in Bozeman and Billings. The Cheyennes simply took the news stoically. They didn't expect mercy at that moment. Naturally, Anavuo was devastated. Even though it happened many months ago and far away from here, the Black Cauldron was like a father to her. For three days, she performed all the Indian morning rituals. She smeared red paint and ashes across her face, fasted and sang funeral songs while rocking in a small teepee she had built to symbolize her grief. She made sacrifices to the Great Spirit at sunrise and sunset every day. I didn't comment or try to interfere, and neither did the rest of the Cheyenne. They understood that this was personal between Anavuo, her father, and the Great Spirit. Three days later, she came out looking exhausted. She slept for almost a day and a half after that. She then quickly returned to her devoted self. She seemed to have made peace with the spirit of the Black Cauldron and was ready to move on. She became convinced that her father was in a better place. In many ways, it was reminiscent of the way we Irish bid farewell to our dead. By when in 876, my captain's business was thriving. I built a real commissariat inside Fort Ellis, and we had another one at Fort Parker. The income from this business enabled me to build a large, substantial log house on 300 acres of land which I purchased on Pitcher Creek. This was about 10 miles east of the fort, towards Yellowstone. I had no intention of working this land. I just wanted a lot of distance between us and our neighbors. I needed space because in those short eight years, the love of my life had already given birth to a healthy and strong boy and two beautiful and energetic girls. We baptized them in a small Catholic church that appeared in Livingston, where the Great West landed. A lot of Irish people moved west, and many of them worked for me in the master's business. Father McCarthy married us. I wanted to make sure that my fortune would go to my companion and assistant if something unpleasant happened to me. The small payment convinced him that the marriage of a white man and an Indian woman was acceptable in the eyes of God. The fact that he had doubts convinced me that he had not read the Bible. John 7.24 and Galatians 3.28 are more than clear about what God thinks about skin color. We gave our children Christian names. But of course, each of them also had a spirit animal and a name given by the Cheyenne priest Mio. We didn't want to lose their connection to this culture. Anavuo was a devoted mother and an excellent wife. She made it her responsibility to cater to my every need. She didn't refuse me anything. But more importantly, her wisdom and guidance were the rock on which our family was built. Her beauty was legendary in the area. That's why we sometimes had guests. I wasn't as stupid as some of these guys thought. I knew that they were coming to confirm the rumors and perhaps try their luck with the captain's wife. But then again, Anavua was very smart. She used her exceptional looks and charm to help us grow our business. That doesn't mean she didn't know what was going on. Indian women learn about men very early in life, and unlike Molly, she never had any illusions about a man's mind. Anavuo was hospitable to everyone, but never allowed the slightest obscenities. She deftly avoided any situation where she would have to draw the line. I didn't need to talk about it. The realization and decision were solely up to my wife. And with one exception, I never had any reason to be angry. However, there was one particularly persistent person. This guy wouldn't leave her alone. Sutton was an Eastern Indian agent. 
He was an educated man, with all the arrogance and condescension that came with it. He thought that Anavuo, being a Cheyenne, and I an ignorant Irishman, should respect his attention to her. Of course, he was a pest. When Anavuo didn't even want to listen to him, he became aggressive. He stopped with us ostensibly to discuss the creation of a post on the Crow Reservation. This would be a profitable business for us. Therefore, he received a royal welcome. He must have taken our hospitality as permission to harass Anavuo. Maybe other captains did things this way, but not us. It was early evening. He was with us for almost half a day. I noticed that he couldn't take his eyes off Anavuo as she busied herself preparing dinner. But many men did this, so I didn't pay attention to it. Until I returned from the barn with samples of our products. She turned to me and said indignantly, he tried to kiss me. I looked at Sutton. He looked at me with contempt and said, what's the big deal? She's just a turkey, isn't she? I'm not. Any more getting involved in fights. I took him out to the stable and discussed his misdeeds with him earnestly. He ended up crying and begging for mercy. I told him, I'll talk to General Gibbon tomorrow, and he won't like what I say about you. So get on your horse. I don't want to see you anymore. If I see you, I'll kill you. We put him on a horse, and he rode off. I spoke to Gibbon, as promised. He was at Fort Ellis, gathering troops for an expedition the army had planned for the summer. By Wendy 1876, I was quite an influential member of the community. So the day after I spoke, Sutton found himself on the train, departing back to the east. We received the contract for the commissariat without any problems, and everything was fine. But now I was indebted to Gibbon. This debt led to the adventure of a lifetime. It was a hot and rainy day in June when I decided to go and find out why the cargo I was expecting had not arrived. I followed Yellowstone looking for Far West and found it at Rosebud Creek. He didn't seem stuck like he sometimes did. Then I noticed many horses and uniforms on the other side. I knew Grant Marsh well. He was the captain and pilot of the Far West and a very intelligent man. We have been doing business for almost four years, but his main source of income was the army, and it seemed that he was hosting a meeting of military commanders on his ship. I saw Gibbon. I had already given him some of my first-class Virginia tobacco as a token of gratitude for his help with Agent Sutton. He was with us in St. Petersburg, and his corps was the one that captured Fort Gregg. But he always had higher command, so I didn't know him as a military man. But I definitely knew the other guy. It was George Armstrong Custer. His friends called him Audie. The only thing that kept us from calling him a vain clown was his remarkable success in battle, strengthened by his connection with the press. Much of his fame was due to his willingness to risk the lives of others, as well as an incredible amount of Custer luck. He wasted a lot of good soldiers, and no one wanted to be assigned to his brigade. This is because throughout the war, Custer attacked where anyone in their right mind would have expected reinforcements. The rioters almost caught him at the station Trevelyan, but Custer always avoided, and with all his rash actions, he himself never received a scratch. I knew many officers like Custer. They had all grown up reading lush Victorian tales of knights, and they all thought that they were the heroes of history. He wore long flowing hair. During the war, he wore a bright velvet uniform that he made for himself. It looked more like something out of a comic opera than an actual military uniform. But it was Audie Custer. He laughed and talked to his bosses as if he were one of them. But the fact remained that General Custer was actually Lieutenant Colonel Custer, the commander of the 7th Cavalry. The third man was the real boss. It was Alfred Terry. He was in the South, in the Carolinas, for most of the war. But I heard that he was a reliable and stable hand. He must have simply enjoyed being saddled with Custer. The only thing I was sure of was that he wouldn't allow it. Cars go far. I asked Marsh what was going on. He was leaning on the rail next to the wheelhouse, calmly smoking his pipe and watching the commotion on the deck below. He told me that the Sioux were causing trouble in Bighorn territory, and the army had decided to put a stop to it once and for all. 
they planned to send three powerful columns to capture the Indians and, if necessary, use force to bring them back to the reservation. He said George Crook's column was somewhere down Rosebud, but Gibbon and Terry met at Far West to coordinate their efforts. I pointed at Audie. He was decked out in a new set of deer skins that made him look like a store-bought version of Kit Carson. I asked, what about Custer? Marsh said, he's doing reconnaissance for Terry. His cavalry can move faster than the infantry columns. I asked, you mean they'll let him go alone? They should send Gibbon and the second cavalry with him. At least Gibbon understands the situation. Marsh said, you know Custer, he wants glory. He has Mitch Boyer and the Ree and Crow scouts to guide him. He won't get into trouble. I asked Marsh about my cargo. He said he was on board and would take it to Livingston Landing as soon as he delivered the army cargo to the confluence of the Bighorn and the Yellowstone. He promised no later than a week. It was satisfactory, so I said goodbye to him. As I walked down the ramp, I heard a voice. Hey, Riley, can I talk to you for a minute? I turned around, and it was John Gibbon. I knew I owed him a debt of gratitude, and I was not going to ignore the most important military man in all of Montana. So of course I quickly got back on board. John Gibbon was a man of action. Unlike the rest of us, he had short hair. But he had the thickest mustache I've ever seen. He said, You know this territory, don't you? I said, Of course, my wife Cheyenne and I have been trading at Fort Ellis and Fort Parker and on the Sioux and Crow reservations for the past five years. Why do you ask? Gibbon looked at me shrewdly and said, I want you to do a little errand. It will repay the debt for what I did for you and Sutton. I am sending Custer up the Rosebud to meet Crook. He has many Indian scouts with him, but he's a reckless idiot, so I want him to have someone reliable to help him understand what he's getting into. He saw what I was thinking and hastily added, Custer's only job is to drive the hostile Indians our way. Infantry and howitzers will fight. There is no risk, and if you do this for me, then I will be in your debt. I knew what he was offering. All forts in Montana Territory will be mine to fleece. I thought about it. Anavuo expected me to return tomorrow, June 24th. I asked Gibbon, how long do you want me to stay with him? Gibbon thought for a second and said, we plan to meet him on the 25th or no later than the 26th, so three days will be enough. It wasn't a lot of time for such a big reward. I thought about it some more. Among the Indians sitting on the riverbank was a guy who looked like a teenage crow. Anavuo speaks crow, so I told Gibbon, I'm all yours if this guy gets a message to my wife. The guy was the son of one of the crow scouts. Both spoke some English. I gave him a note for Anavuo and a gold coin, which overpaid him. But I wanted the message to get through. Custer had no intention of leaving until he had demonstrated the entire 7th Cavalry before the generals. Like I said, he was a show-off. Then all 600 of us headed down Rosebud singing Gary Owen, while Terry and Gibbon led their infantry towards the Bighorn. Gibbon made sure Custer knew who I was. He told Custer to listen to me. Therefore, of course, I was moved to the end of the column. I rode with the rest of the people whom Custer did not want to listen to. I didn't care since I was going to make a lot of money just by participating in the three-day walk. I rode with a gray-eyed killer named Benteen and Miles Kiagam, who was a real Irishman. Both hated Custer with such a passion that only his second-in-command, Marcus Renault, could rival them. Of course, like most narcissistic fools, Custer had his admirers. Yates, Weir, Calhoun, and his brother Tom all rode in a small, adoring group around him. He even had his own newspaper reporter named Kellogg. I had not been in this detachment for more than half a day, and I already realized that we would have problems if a battle broke out, because half the command wanted Custer dead. So naturally trouble found us. Scouts arrived early the next morning to report a large Indian camp in the next river valley to the west, which was the Little Big Horn Valley. Going there was completely contrary to Terry's orders to Custer. Custer was ordered to reconnoiter Rosebud rather than chase hostile Indians into another river valley. 
If Custer had done what Terry told him, he would have eventually run into Crook. Everything would be different if he did. But that's not the style cars. He smelled glory, so he headed west. All that day we moved through hills and valleys, looking for Indians. It was extremely hot and dry on the arid high plains, and most of us were on the verge of exhaustion. I thought Gibbon owed me a big debt for all this trouble. It was a complete waste of my time. Custer never acknowledged me, so I was of no use to him, and his minions all the time looked with contemptuous smiles when I said something. Boyer was friendly. Of course, we knew each other since we spent a lot of time in these parts. He said that Custer was determined to do to the village we were chasing what he did to the village of the Black Kettle, that is, completely destroy. We spent the night of the 24th in camp southeast of the Little Big Horn Valley, by Castor and scouts examined the area. He returned full of enthusiasm. There was a large village located on the river, and it seemed as if the whole Sioux tribe might be in it. If Castor thought about what it meant, he could be with us today, but thinking was not Akai's forte. After dinner, the officers held a small meeting. I joined them to find out what was going on. All of Custer's fans wanted to attack the next morning. They were afraid the Indians would run away if they didn't. I said, didn't Terry order you to drive the Indians towards him instead of attacking them yourself? Reno and Benteen nodded vigorously in agreement. Custer's entire retinue looked at me with hostile eyes. Custer said with a sneer, We've finally caught these savages, and I won't let them get away. Terry is too slow and too careful. They'll run away if we wait for him. His retinue nodded in agreement. What Custer really said was that he wanted all the glory for himself. I heard him mutter under his breath, If we defeat them tomorrow, I will still have time to announce my victory at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. So that's what it was. He was speeding things up because he wanted to launch his political career on America's 100th birthday. We attacked tomorrow because Custer needed to catch a train to get back east in time. My Irish temperament skyrocketed. I said, this is not Wachita, Akai. There will be no old men, women, and children there. There will be Sioux and Cheyenne warriors, the best of their warriors, and there will be many of them. He and his retinue laughed contemptuously. He said, the Indians will not stand against the cavalry. As soon as they see us, they will run. I am more afraid of them running away than of them fighting us. He then looked at me slyly and said conspiratorially, that's why we'll capture their women and children first. They'll come back and fight if we capture their families. I thought to myself, this guy doesn't understand at all. His only experience fighting Indians is destroying defenseless villages. Attacking Oglala, Hunk Papa, or Brule families would make their warriors furious. I said, You've never seen Akita Lakota warriors or Cheyenne dog soldiers in action. I have. They were born on a horse and are fearless to a fault. If we threaten their women and children, they won't stop until we're all dead. Custer laughed again and said, Well, if you're afraid, you can leave any time. This put me in a difficult position. I put up with this clown and his illusions for two days. All this time would have been wasted if I had not been with him when we met Gibbon. At dawn I rode with Miles Keogh. I liked Keogh. He was my type of Irishman. He was handsome and charismatic, with a sparkle in his eye for women and a classic Irish sense of humor. He wore medals that the Pope gave him for his service in the Vatican Army before he came to serve in our army. His people loved him. Custer divided his team into two. He sent 300 of Reno's soldiers to attack a huge camp at a bend in the river, about three miles away. I could see the village in the distance, in the morning heat haze. It was arranged in circles. There were so many teepees there it looked like New York. I had a feeling, but I still drove on. Custer led five companies up the hills and ridges across the river. Keogh's company was in this unit. It was a bright and sunny Sunday morning, and it was getting hot. 
The choking dust from our movement was oppressive, and it was difficult to see what lay ahead as the long column of horsemen advanced along the crest of the hills. Custer's determination inspired some men, but most of his team, including senior officers, did not trust him. Therefore, an alarming number of soldiers were urgent and led their seemingly tired horses as the column advanced. I saw this trick many times during the war. I even used it myself once, off Cold Harbor. This is a convenient way to avoid a fight when you don't have confidence in the people at the helm. In the end, these guys turned out to be the luckiest. They eventually joined Reno and survived. The heat was so oppressive that Custer took off his dear shirt, and he acted crazy. He kept shouting to his adjutant Vivi, Cook, that he had finally caught these savages. Then he would jump forward excitedly. My premonition intensified. This guy didn't take the danger seriously. Below, it seemed that Reno had launched an attack. A mass of Indian warriors ran out of the village. The last thing I saw as we climbed the hills and rounded the salient was that a line of Indians, apparently outnumbering Reno's force three or four to one, was beginning to envelop his flanks. At this point, Renault appeared to hasten his men to form a line of skirmishers. This was not what Custer had planned. Renault had to drive straight through the Indians and straight into the village. This would provide the necessary anvil for Custer's hammer. It was obvious that Akai had greatly underestimated the number and determination of the warriors in this camp. I could hear gunfire from Reno's group as we moved along the hills. Until now we have not been noticed. Kiog, who was an experienced man, shouted, Renault is in trouble. We must go back to help him. But Custer ignored him. Ante was a man with a mission. His goal was to keep the Indians from escaping. He planned to do this by threatening their women. The problem was that the only movement the Indians made was towards the battle. However, despite all the obvious evidence, Castor continued to advance. The sounds of gunfire faded behind us. We walked a few more miles when we came across a ravine that allowed us to drop right into the middle of the camp. Custer apparently planned to attack from the far end of the village to drive the Indians back to Reno. But the village was much larger than he expected. However, he launched an attack down the ravine, right into the middle of the village. I did not participate because Custer had split his company again, and I was in the hills with Keegan, who commanded the second group. Several warriors met Custer at the river, and the attack stopped right there. I still don't know why they stopped, and then retreated up the hill to our right. It seemed that someone had shot Custer and his standard bearer. Perhaps this was the reason Castor fell into the water with a big splash. Then a group of his men ran towards him. They left the standard bearer where he fell. Another reason could be that Custer saw a huge force of Indians running along the river bank and through the village. It seemed that they had already dealt with Reno and were now returning to fight him. Either way, the attack stopped right there, and no one involved survived to explain why. I remained calm. It seemed like we had everything under control. Around me there were almost 250 well-armed and well-trained cavalrymen. Castor moved to the right, up the hills towards the ridge. Kiog pushed his company in the same direction. Apparently we were going to secure a foothold in the hills and let the Indians attack our fast-firing Springfield 73 rifles but the Indians advanced so quickly that we had no time to unite into one defensive position. We could survive if we could gather all our soldiers on one hill, as Reno did. But Custer signed his own death warrant when he divided his forces again. So Custer's group, Smith, Yates, and Tom Custer were on the same hill. Keog and Calhoun were on the other, perhaps a hundred yards apart. Most of Tom Custer's company was with Keogham, since Tom was with his brother. We therefore entrenched ourselves with Calhoun's Company L and Tom Custer's Company C, forming a line of skirmishers in front of us. Keogh's company I was behind with the horses. According to cavalry tactics, every fourth man held horses for the other three. Therefore Keogh's group had more men than the thin blue line in front of us. The Indians attacked like a swarm of bees, but we should have dealt with them quickly if we had a clear field of fire. The problem was that the hill was full of ravines and cracks, and the warriors advanced through them, 
as they do when hunting buffalo. They were invisible until they appeared at the last moment to shoot at us point blank. To make matters worse, the Springfield rifles began to jam, as they always did when they overheated. Therefore, the volume of our shooting was not what it should have been. In addition, the Indians seemed to use Sharps and Henry rifles, which were both longer range and faster firing than ours. The line of skirmishers under the command of Handsome Jim Calhoun fired a couple of powerful volleys. He promised Custer, who was his son-in-law, that he would not let him down, and he did not disappoint. Calhoun's fight was the only organized resistance that day. Everything else was just soldiers firing at random through clouds of gunpowder smoke. The riflemen were overtaken before they could fire a third salvo. There were too many warriors, and they simply overwhelmed our guys. A fierce struggle began. Then the Indians turned their attention to us. Everyone in the circle around Keog was shooting except me. I didn't have a weapon, and I didn't want to shoot these people, even to save my life. They were just reacting to an unprovoked attack on your village. Everyone understood this. Nobody expected mercy. The soldiers shot down enough horses that they formed a kind of parapet. Most of the soldiers were hiding behind dead horses. Time slowed down and I was strangely calm. I knew I was going to die. But I lived a good life with a wonderful woman, and she will be well settled after I die. Sooner or later we all leave. A final firefight ensued, and a group of figures emerged from the gunpowder smoke. The Indians surrounded us from the right flank, from where Castor. The soldiers around me all turned and ran, trying to saddle their horses. My last words were, Anavuo. I woke up to a familiar voice shouting something Cheyenne. There was still chaos around me. There was severe pain in my shoulder. But I was alive. I was lying on the grass where I fell. Someone was standing over my body, protecting me. It was a woman, and from time to time she shouted furious warnings to us. I heard Anavuo's voice speaking in English. Lie still, my beloved. The warriors are beginning to calm down and leave. We will help you as soon as they leave. I was confused. The last thing I remembered was a shootout with seemingly all the Indians in the world. And now I am with my dear wife. I didn't understand what happened or what she was doing there. It was pretty clear that Custer and all his men were dead. But why am I still alive, and how did Anavuo end up here? She was wearing her beautiful deerskin dress, rather than the fashionable linen dresses she usually wore. I instinctively knew that she wore this dress because she wanted the Indians to understand that she was one of them. This allowed her to move freely among them. Two Indians appeared. I expected them to finish me off. Anavuo seemed to be asking them about the situation. Whatever they said seemed to satisfy Anavuo, because she answered something and both crouched down with their guns, as if they were guarding us. I was amazed to see that it was the guy I paid to deliver Anavuo's note and his father. She explained that she had received my note. Every Cheyenne in Montana knew that the annual sun dance was held on the Bighorn lands. All the tribes will be there, because their sun dance is like Easter for Christians. So she also knew that I was heading straight to a very dangerous place. She assumed that sooner or later I would reach a large camp. Otherwise there wouldn't be a problem. So she hired two warriors to ride with her up the Little Bighorn. They covered almost 90 miles between our home and where we were in two days, driving at full speed. They arrived just as the battle began. Without hesitation, Anavuo rode through the village, jumped off her horse by the river, and ran up the hill with the charging warriors right into the cavalry's guns. It was the most enduring act of naked courage and personal devotion I have ever heard. Her heroism saved my life. It was clear who would win the fight at that moment. So she hurried to find me before the cleanup began. Custer had indeed disturbed a hornet's nest, and the Indians were furious. I would have been the target of this fury if it had not been for my valiant wife. She stood over my body like a mother bear protecting her cubs. Anavuo had an Arkansas toothpick knife on her slender belt and two brand new 45 caliber revolvers in each hand. She drove away any warrior who approached us, shouting threats at Cheyenne, Sioux, and Arapaho. The entire battle, from the river to the aftermath, 
took no more than an hour. Suddenly everything became quiet, like a cemetery. All the soldiers went up the river, to where there was intense shooting. It must have been Renault. Only a few women remained, chatting as if they were doing laundry and busily stripping the dead soldiers of their clothes. Anavuo and her escort put me on a horse. There were many cavalry horses around. Then we drove east, away from this valley of death, and around the north, heading home. Nobody paid any attention to us. I asked Anavuo whatever possessed her to do such a crazy thing. I said, You didn't know where I was or what was going on. How did you know I was in danger? And how did you find me? She looked at me with her smart blue eyes and said, Would you do the same for me? She was right, of course. I said, If I thought you were in danger, I would ride, walk, or crawl to you through every danger imaginable. But how did you know I was in danger? And how did you find me? She said, Your note said you were coming down Rosebud with Custer. I knew he would find this camp. This is our main gathering of the year. It didn't take a seer to see that this would be the outcome if Custer attacked. On him. She looked at me with absolute confidence and said, So I knew you were in danger. She added nonchalantly, I also knew that you could have left Custer before anything happened. But you are a man of your word and stubborn as a mule. So I decided that I would find you right where you were. I said, still confused, but I was with 250 other men. She said, as if I was stupid, you think I wouldn't recognize my man? I saw you there before I even got to the river. You were the only person on the hill in a top hat and tails. She laughed cheerfully and added, you didn't look very military. She was right. I was in my business attire when I went on the trip with Custer. I probably stood out like a peacock among chickens. She added lightly, of course, getting to you was a challenge, with all the gunfire and smoke. But I knew where you were, and I wasn't going to stop until I found you. She added grimly, I couldn't even imagine what my people would do to every soldier there, and I wasn't going to let that happen to you. I thought to myself, this is what my woman is capable of, and this is what true love and devotion means. We were driving home, just the two of us. It has always been this way, and it will always be so, a man and woman living together, both selflessly caring for each other at all costs. It didn't matter that we came from two different worlds. It was important that we loved each other in this world, and deep and sincere love between two people is the recipe for a happy life. So, my friends, this is how I became the sole survivor of the battle that pulp novels call Custer's Last Stand. No one else lived to record my rescue, and I had no intention of enlightening anyone. My only goal was to live a quiet, private life with the woman I loved. The last thing I wanted was to be inundated with people wanting to hear my story. The world has changed since 1876. The Indian tribes on the plains all disappeared. We have fought much bigger wars. Paved roads and railroad tracks replaced the washed-out wagon tracks. Lucky Lindy flew all the way from New York to Paris, France, and I drove from Billing to Greasy Grass in one of these new cars. It only took a few hours. I found Keog's monument. He indicated the place where he fell. Keog himself is buried in the east. It was exactly where I remembered because I was standing next to him when I was injured. I still feel it even at the age of 86 years old. There, on the hill of the last battle, there is a much more grandiose monument. This is near where Custer was found. I was sure he would have liked it. I remembered where the big village was. Looking down the hill toward the Crow Reservation, I could still visualize her there. The weather in the fading light was hot and dry just like that momentary day. It was quiet on this hill, only the wind. It was getting dark. I turned and walked slowly down the back of the hill to where my grandson's car was parked. The only people left in the dirt parking lot were my grandson and his wife. This was where the horses of the 7th Cavalry were kept 54 years ago. My dear Anavuo died a couple of weeks ago. She died a venerable and respected matriarch of a large and important family. This is what we built together. Now it's my turn. 
I just wanted to visit this place one last time to honor our eternal love. As the Indians say, today is a good day to die, and I have no desire to live without her. I'm not afraid that my body will turn into a spirit. My only wish is to come to her as she came to me on that fateful day at Greasy Grass. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.